Good evening and welcome back to the War Games table. Today I want to give you a quick run through of the rules in Renegade Scout without the accoutrement of a battle going on as well. So this should be a fairly short video just describing how the mechanics work and it'll probably be the last video I might do of Renegade Scout for a little while. So up here we can see some, some kind of notional forces. When you're setting up your Renegade Scout battles you have a point system that can balance one army against another and, and there's some caveats in there that it's not perfectly balanced and you should have about 25% more points if you're uh, someone assaulting a defensive position, um, but generally um, it seems to work out okay. Um, you have different costs for armor and guns, um, vehicles, psychic powers and so on. So here we have three space marines and a dreadnought, we have three orcs and a dreadnought, and we have a psychic over here, a weird user. So the first thing that happens in a game of Renegade Scout is that you roll off for the very first activation. And so you add your team's initiative, so uh, intellect scores, and since these have the same intellect, that means the Marines win the initiative. The first phase would be uh, movement. And if you had any involuntary movement, so for example, fleeing, or if your unit is broken, you would do that now first. Um, and then you start activating alternate for your movement. So over here, we'll have these Marines do a bit of movement. And now movement is varied per unit, and in some cases per figure. In this particular case, all the Marines have a movement of five. Now, if you've watched any of my battle reports, you know I use a half scale, so that would be two and a half inches. So, for example, we can move this Marine across two and a half inches. The only caveats to that are moving through um, dense woodland or heavy ground like this, difficult ground, halves your movement, and an obstacle requires half of whatever your move is, you have to spend half of it to get over an obstacle, like these hedges at the back here. The last caveat is that you need to maintain squad coherency which is two inches between figures in full size game. You can also have open formation, such as this, which could be up to four inches per figure. The advantage of that, of course, is that you can cover more ground, but you also have a minus one leadership when you're taking break tests. Now play would come over to the orcs. So orcs could move a certain distance. Let's just say we're not gonna get quite into close combat yet. And then we'd have the marine player move, and then we'd have the orc player move. The next phase is the shooting phase, and you similarly, you start with a player that has priority, and then you move back and forth. So over here, let's just say for the sake of argument, we're going to fire with those marines into the orcs. Weapons have a profile which includes long and short ranges, and modifiers for them. Typically, what happens is, if you have a short range, then you get a plus one, normally. So these three marines are going to fire into these orcs. What we'll need to do is roll underneath their ballistic skill. So their ballistic skill is four, so we need fours or less. So we get two hits and their weapon strength is four versus the toughness of the orcs, which is three. So because they have an advantage, it means we will wound on fives or less, sorry, fives or less. So we have one wound here. Now the bolters have an armor piercing of one. And since the orcs can only save on a one, that means they're unable to save that shot. And we have one orc down. These orcs can now return fire. There'll be one orc firing a bolter, which is this closer one here. So he'll need to roll three or less because he has a worse ballistic skill and he misses. Then we'll have the Heavy Bolter fire. The Heavy Bolter is a sustained fire weapon. And if you're familiar with second edition or Rogue Trader, you'll know there's all kinds of funny rules about uh, sustained fire and follow fire and how that works. Um, in this particular case, um, you simply roll the dice and if you get a uh, double six, then you have a jam. And if you get a double one, you get another shot. So we rolled one underneath his ballistic skill of three. So we get one hit there. It's the same strength as a regular Bolter and the Marines have toughness three. Because remember, we're using the stats from Rogue Trader Marines, who had a toughness three and a 50% chance of saving. So the heal will need a five or less, which he gets. And the armor piercing for the heavy bolter is also one. So the Marines would need a one, two, or three to save normally. But because of that armor piercing, they just need a one or a two to save. And they can't save it. So we have one Marine down. And you continue alternating fire between all the units on the table until that's complete. Vehicles, in this case, form exactly the same, perform exactly the same. You have to put a pilot in those vehicles and the statistics for things like ballistic skill and weapon skill come from the pilot. In taking damage, rather than being knocked out immediately, they have a number of wounds they can take each. And every time that you do cause a wound on a vehicle, you roll the dice. And if you come up with a one on that dice as the attacker, then that causes a critical hit. And there's a short table which describes some interesting critical hit impacts like um, immobilization or weapons failure or uh, going haywire, exploding, that kind of thing. Right, that covers movement and shooting. Now let's just imagine we have a combat going on. I've rearranged everything here to show what combat might look like. In this case, the orcs have charged into the space marines, and it's only units in base to base which can contribute to combat. So this marine over here 
um, is unfortunately uh, unable to contribute. He'll have to abide by the success or failure of this combat, the win or loss, and any subsequent morale rolls, um, but he, he can't actually participate yet. If this unit was able to activate, these figures here, because they're in base to base, would be unable to do anything except stay where they are, because they're going to be preparing to fight a round of combat. But this figure here could move up to his normal move to get into base to base contact with someone else. I'm not going to do that because I'm going to show you what the implications of outnumbering are. So in this combat here in the back, we have an orc and a marine, and they both have one attack each. But the orc, because they charged, will attack first. If the orc hadn't charged, you would go by order of strength. So. The orc rolled one, which is a hit, because he has to roll underneath his weapon skill, or equal to it. He has a weapon skill of three. So he has hit the marine. He is equipped with a knife and has a strength of four. Uh, versus a toughness three of the marine means he has an advantage, so he needs to roll five or less. And so he rolls five or less. The knife does not have any armor piercing, so the marine simply needs to roll a three or less to save. And so the marine saves that hit. Now the marine can fight back. He needs to roll under his weapon skill, which is four. He does. And he also has a knife and a strength of four so he will need fives as well and so he is able to uh, attack and hit the orc and wound now the orc has a saving throw the saving throw of the orc is uh, one or two uh, and there is no armor piercing on that so he gets to roll a one or two and he also saves so that combat's a draw now let's imagine we fought the first combat over here which will be exactly the same but now we have an, an additional combatant here now there's an order of precedence to how additional combat works initially you start subtracting attacks from the outnumbered person uh, for every additional person, every additional enemy in combat. So, for example, if this, this character had uh, two attacks, he would get two attacks against this, and then one attack against here, um, against this orc. Because he already has one attack, he can't go any lower than that, you start adding attacks to the opponents. So this orc will get two attacks now. He also gets the first attack because he charged, and he hits, needing a three or less. He will wound on a five or less, which he does, and the marine will save on a three or less. And the marine does not save that attack. So this marine is dead. So the marines have lost this fight, so the first thing that happens is they get pushed back, and the orcs can follow up. And now the marines need to make a test for morale. They need to roll equal to or underneath their leadership skill, which is eight. And with an eight, they are able to stand their ground, and they don't, they don't flee. If they had have uh, taken flight, then every orc in base-to-base -base contact with a marine would have got one free hit that hits automatically. You just need to roll to wound and save on there. And the marines would have fled 2d6 inches. So in this case, 10 inches. In my world, 5 inches. So that's close combat for you. A penultimate phase in the turn of Rogue Trader is a psychic phase. Let's imagine this is our psyker and he's the only one we've got. And you as a psyker have a psychic level. In this case, he happens to be a level 2 psyker, only because I've got those statistics in front of me from one of my previous games. And his psychic level is 7. That means in order to cast a psychic power, he needs to roll a 7 or less. There's a 7, so he can cast a psychic power. And it's as simple as that. And those powers uh, vary tremendously. You roll them uh, through a randomly assigned table of D100, and they can be everything from causing an enemy to troop to flee, or moving one of your units, or in this case, he has a, a particular psychic power called Mental Assault, which means you can immediately roll a round of combat against an enemy figure within 12 inches. And if he loses that combat, um, he doesn't take any wounds, nor does he flee. Um, but he, uh, he is able to cause wounds, himself. he is able to cause damage himself. And that's the psychic phase. And the very last phase of the turn for Renegade Scout is the rally phase. If a unit was broken at the start of the turn, let's imagine, they are able to rally by rolling underneath their, uh, their leadership skill. You can't be broken and then rally in the same phase, that's not how it works. So you'll always lose, potentially, a turn running away and then regrouping. Um, if you roll a double six, that's an automatic failure, obviously. And if you roll a double one, then that would be an automatic pass. Now, Renegade Scout contains loads of other mechanics for things like building bridges, uh, demolishing buildings, hacking terminals, um, drop pods, teleportation, and so on. Um, but those are really advanced rules. And what I've shown you today is just the, the base mechanics of the game. I think it's a fantastic game to get that feel for Rogue Trader. And I'm always reluctant to get the figures out, but once I do and I start moving them around, it, it makes me feel really happy and I really quite enjoy it. So I would be wary about judging the game by what you see in the battle reports that I've done, or um, if you're not happy with this explanation of the rules. Because there is really something about the way it plays on the table and the, the feeling that evokes of that classic second edition Rogue Trader uh, feel, but without... Uh, all of the difficulty in war gear cards and conflicting rules and ambiguity, it's all really uh, straight down the line on this one. 
If I had to say there was one drawback, it is that Renegade Scout has a uh, obsession with differentiating itself from Games Workshop. And some of that must be legal, and I think some of that is just the view of the writer, where um, he's changing changing words and changing the names and mechanics uh, for the sake of them being changed, rather than the fact that they add or, or um, affect anything in the game. So, uh, you know, initiative becomes observation, strength becomes power, uh, weapon skill becomes uh, melee skill, uh, and I, I think I don't think that's necessary particularly, and especially since 99% of the people who are going to be playing Renegade Scout are going to be using Games Workshop figures, uh, or, or, or in this case, figures which are meant to represent Games Workshop figures, and are going to be wanting to to play a Games Workshop style game. It just seems like a bit ridiculous to to have all that that uh, substitution. That said, I hope this was informative and, and enjoyable, and I hope you will give Renegade Scout a shot. Uh, please do let me know if you do. I would love to hear about it. Thank you.